this is the kind of tool that if you had described it to me before I saw it, I would have said, there's no way that could possibly work. I'm glad to be wrong. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. It's not often that I devote an entire video to one tool, but this is such a day. I want to talk about the Tornado. It's a freehand turning system for metal lathes. It also does pattern copying, tracing, ball turning, and a lot of other really, really cool things. It's by an Australian company called Eccentric Engineering. I love their stuff. Follow them on Instagram if you aren't already. This is not a sponsored video, but a very generous viewer did send me the complete Tornado package. So I'm going to show you how it all works, and I'm going to show you how I could have used it on a recent project here on the channel. So stay tuned for that part because it's really, really cool. Let's go. Here is the Tornado kit all the way from Australia as I received it. Very well packaged, as you can see. And let's get this thing unboxed. I started with the craziest thing by accident. This is the tracer arm, which we'll see much more of later. Comes with tool bits and some risers. All of these little bits here form the base that everything rides on. There's the tool post there. That's an especially lovely little part. And this is a pile of contraptions that are all the various attachments, which we'll see here in a little bit. Now, there is a little bit of a, let's say, late afternoon project to get the Tornado adapted to your lathe. The base plate here is two parts connected by those risers, and you have to adapt them to your lathe which is perfectly reasonable because there's 10,000 lathes in the world and there's no way you could make a bolt-on kit that would fit all of them. So let's get started with that. I had vague notions of maybe being able to mount it here with my tool post in place, but I was quickly disabused of that idea. You really do need to mount it instead of your tool post. So get used to that and get used to removing and reinstalling your tool post a lot during this setup process. My tool post happens to mount with these T-bolts here that I made. These are actually shop-made versions of the factory ones, which crapped out after a couple of years. And the idea is this bottom plate here is intended to be modified to suit whatever compound slide mounting system your lathe uses. I spent some time trying to figure out where on the cross slide I should mount this thing. Most people seem to mount it centered on where the tool post goes, but I wasn't 100% sure that was the best way to do it. So I did consider some options, but in the end, it did seem like actually, yeah, you do want it centered right where the tool post would go. So then the question is, well, should it go in this orientation? Let's call this vertical, or should it perhaps go in the other orientation, horizontal? And the instructions don't say, so I went and watched a few other people's videos. Uh, shout out to John Creasy and Mark Presling, both of whom have great videos on the Tornado that I referenced for this. And those two fine gentlemen mounted them opposite from each other. So I decided to create a system where I can mount it both ways and I can figure out later which works better for me. In my case, I'm taking the measurements off my cross slide T slots here because that'll give me the spacing for some mounting holes that I'm going to need to drill in that base plate. So math, 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 and I figure out where the center line of those T-slots is and thus what the spacing of the holes needs to be. My lathe also has this hole here in the center and the compound slide has a little boss on the bottom of it that rides in that. So I'll need to replicate that on the bottom of the Tornado. I used some gauge pins to figure out what size this hole is. And as you can see, it's not especially round. It's a little bit wallowed out, no doubt from me abusing it over 10 years of many a ham-fisted project on this lathe. I then also sketched out a little boss that I can mount to the bottom of the tornado plate and we'll have a bolt that passes through and threads into the center pillar there of the tornado. I dug through my scrap bin here to find a piece of scrap that would be suitable for this pin and oh, would you look at that? It's a little piece of 1144 stress proof and it's the perfect size. That is a delightful thing. That's why I never throw away offcuts and probably why I will someday die in a collapsed pile of offcuts. This little boss is a trivial little part to make. It's just turning something down to diameter, making sure that's a really nice close fit there on that gauge pin that we measured. And then I center drill and drill this through clearance size for the M6 bolt that holds the center riser in place on the Tornado base. That looks good, so I will part this off to length. 
This length is reasonably important because the boss here needs to sit below the level of the cross slide or else it's going to interfere with the tornado base sitting flat on the cross slide. I ended up very close to the chuck here, so here's a trick to make sure that you're not going to hit the chuck jaws there when the parting blade moves in. Put your scale up against the edge of the tool holder there and then give the jaws a spin because that scale is effectively telling you where the edge of the tool holder is going to be when that parting blade is pushed into the stock. That's what's going to get you, because of course the tool does not stick out as far as the tool holder does. And Yahtzee. There's my completed little bushing there, all deburred and ready for a test fit. And that is looking very good on diameter. It's a very nice close sliding fit there. Now a quick test with the mounting bolt that's going to go through it. And of course I forgot to account for the thickness of the bolt head. So that is sticking up too much. I'll use my calipers to get a rough idea of how much to remove, and then I'll remove a generous amount more than that just to make sure that we're well below the surface here when this thing is installed. So of course I had to put the tool post back on to do that, and now I have to take it off again for another test fit. And there we are. We're below the surface now with the bolt installed, so Bob's your uncle. That's what it looks like bolted to the tornado plate through into one of the risers there. And that sits down there very, very nice. Looking good. Note that's not the actual correct center riser there. The center riser is threaded on both ends and that's what holds the two plates together. Over to the mill now and I'm going to set up to drill the holes. So I'm going to flip the jaw around on the movable jaw on my vise so that I can get the capacity I need to hold this large plate here. Then I'll bring in an adjustable parallel and I can use a 1-2-3 block and raise the parallel up to meet it so then the parallel is at the same height as the body of the vise jaw there and then the vise jaw acts as the other parallel to hold the plate in place here. I can tighten that up. Now the question is, are the holes I'm going to drill going to hit the vise? And in this case it looks like they might. It's a little too close for comfort. So I'm going to modify my setup here with a parallel lying sideways. So once again I'll bring the adjustable parallel up to this new height, and then that becomes the parallel on the fixed jaw, and I place this parallel on its side here under the other side, and that spaces things up just enough to where I've got clearance underneath the part for the drills to break through. Now it's a little close for comfort, so here's a little trick. You can use a piece of 15 thou shim stock as a drill shield, if you will, underneath the part. And shim stock is spring steel, which is very difficult to drill through. So you're not going to drill through it accidentally, and you're going to feel it when the drill hits that. I find this trick to be excellent apprentice mark insurance for your vise. My mounting holes need to be a bolt pattern centered on the center hole of the tornado plate there. So I line myself up on that hole with a gauge pin there. The holes that I'm drilling are just clearance holes for bolts. So this method of aligning on the center hole is accurate enough for that. Then I can center drill and drill these out. I'm just using the DRO here. I've calculated the radius of this hole pattern and it's just a four hole pattern. So I just go plus and minus X and Y the same amount on both axes on the DRO. Very easy. Well, easy until I get to the fourth hole, which of course I don't have the Y travel range on my mill to reach. That's a common problem with these little mills. That's okay though, we'll come back to that hole and I'll drill the three that I can reach in the meantime. I'm being careful on each hole to make sure that my drill shield shim underneath there is in the correct place. Then after pilot drilling, I drill them all out to the clearance size for the T-bolts on my lathe. Because this is a symmetrical bolt pattern, it's pretty easy to change my setup to reach that one hole there that I have left. So I set up an end stop there on X with an indicator stand there, and that allows me to take the plate out and I deburred it so that it'll sit back down again 180 degrees off, and of course the fixed jaw on the vise allows me to repeat the Y position of the part, and I double check with that gauge pin again to make sure that zero on the DRO is still zero, and it is. So now I can drill that top hole again, which is now the bottom hole. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy, but only with consent.
Time for yet another test fit of the plate here. Hopefully the last one for the modifications to the plate. And that fits on there really, really nicely. Very pleased with that. Turns out if you measure things carefully, they fit. That's looking really good. And it even fits the other way. Capital. And I also double check that it still clears the hand wheel when I bring it all the way back, and it does, so that's nice. Although it gets a little hard to read the markings. The next step is the biggest trick of this setup, which is to get the risers to be the correct height. So you need to assemble the table assembly here with the risers installed and put it back on your lathe. And the risers are supplied longer than necessary and you have to machine them down to the correct height for your lathe. This is to ensure that the tool bit on the tornado ends up on center when we're done. I'm doing kind of a rough check here with the caliper just to see roughly how much work I have to do here. This is not an accurate way to measure this, but as you can see, we are aiming for a 32 millimeter height on that table. So I've got five millimeters to remove, give or take. But now I need to measure that accurately. So I'm gonna do it the way that the instructions recommend, which is to put some stock in the spindle here and turn it down to a convenient diameter. In my case, I went with 500 thou. And now for the real measurement. I'm going to remove the tool post once again, and I'm gonna stone everything, make sure there's no burrs that are gonna mess this up. My cross slide was due for a stoning anyway, so I do that using my precision ground flat stone there until I can't feel any burrs. Everything's nice and flat and smooth. And then I bolt the plate down into position and fully torque it down, install it for real. And then I can use a depth micrometer to measure from the top surface of that stock that I turned to the plate. Then just subtract the radius of that stock and we have the height that the table is currently at below the center line of the spindle. And this is all gonna be very accurate because that stock was turned in situ. So it's extremely concentric with the spindle bearings. Math, math, math. And I determined that I need to remove 204 thousandths off of each of the risers in the kit. The risers are a convenient three quarter size. So I'll use the call of Chuck here and clamp those down. Then I touch the tool very lightly on the surface there. And I set up a dial indicator on my carriage that I can move in the exact 204 thousandths that I need. And then I face this off in a series of passes. There's the 200 and there's the four. Then I'll replace the chamfer that I removed with that facing because chamfers are what separate us from the animals. After doing that to all five risers, I remove the tool post, put the tornado plate back on, and we can check the results. Note how the table slides nicely under the collachuck, and the kit recommends using a collachuck with this, and I think that's a very, very good idea, not just for clearance, but because your fingers are gonna be in real close to the spinning meat cleavers of death that would be chuck jaws. I came in about three thousandths lower than I intended, but that's okay because the tool post actually has 20 thou of height adjustment in it as well, so you don't have to be perfect with this. Speaking of that tool post, here it is. Let's take another look at it because it's very clever. It's cast iron and the bottom looks like it's been lapped to make it nice and smooth and easy to slide around. And the really clever bit here is how the tool bit is inboard of the base here. The base sticks out further. And what that means is that the pressure of the machining forces is not ever going to cause it to tip forward like that. And that's what makes it safe to turn metal by hand like this. You can't turn metal the same way you would on a wood lathe because the machining forces would just rip the tool out of your hand. The clever design of this tool post is what enables that. The other clever thing about this tool post is the height adjustment. This sleeve that holds the tool bit is at an angle in the tool post, but the tool bit still sits level because there's an opposite angle in the groove there. So as you slide the tool bit in and out, it stays at the same height, which is nice. You can adjust the reach, but then because the entire sleeve itself is angled, if you pull it in and out with this other adjustment screw at the back, you adjust the height of the tool bit without adjusting the angle, which is really, really cool. A much better design than, for example, the typical parting blade holder where you can't adjust blade position or height without affecting the other variable. Very annoying. Visually now that looks like that's on center, but a facing cut is a great way to know for sure. So I'll go ahead and do that. This will allow me to dial in the tool height if needed, and it'll be my first real cut on the tornado. So it's exciting. First chips with this new tool. Here we go. Whoa. Oh, oh, it's pretty freaky. 
It's pretty freaky to make chips with your bare hands, I'm not gonna lie. I feel a little bit like I have godlike powers. So this works surprisingly well, it's quite easy to do. It is a little bit tricky though to get the pressure just right. You can see the tool kind of skipping around on me a little bit there. And that happens if you don't get the inward pressure just right on the tool. So it takes some practice and it does take practice to get a good surface finish there. So you can see that the finish is really good except for some lines there I have where the tool skipped a little bit. I'll try some sort of freehand turning next because the height actually seems to be just great where it is. So I'll round over that edge a little bit. So far so good. Let's give the ball turning tool a try next. So you stick one of these pins that come in the kit in the table there and you attach this little bracket to the bottom of the tool post and presto instant ball turner. Now getting the radius set right is a little tricky. It's pretty much just by eye. There isn't really a easy way that I could figure out to dial this in really, really accurately. This is a bit of an issue with all the Tornado tools. They're mainly cosmetic tools, I think. If you needed a really accurate radius, you might have some trouble getting it with these tools because there aren't really a lot of fine adjustments on things. I did my best to get the radius set correctly by touching off on the side and the end of the part here. And hopefully I can turn a hemisphere now that matches the diameter of this stock. But let's find out. I'm feeding in with the carriage here because that seemed to be the easiest in this setup. So I'm feeding in like 10 thousandths at a time. And what happens is the slot on the end of the radius tool actually self limits the depth of cut for you. Because if you try to push in harder than that, the cutting forces will push back and it'll slide out on that slot. So it's kind of an interesting design feature. So what you do is you move in a little bit on the hand wheel and then you make cuts until you're at the full depth of that little slot at the end of the radius tool. I think that's intentional. The other thing is that the tool has a three degree clearance angle ground on all sides of it. And that is intentional because that limits the depth of cut as well. You're gonna start rubbing on the part very quickly with a three degree clearance angle. And so all of those things contribute to making this thing basically safe to turn by hand. Now in my case, I ended up with kind of a bullet shape as you can see here, and that's because I didn't do a very good job of aligning the tool bit on the Y axis there at the end of its travel. So I kind of cut a cord off of the arc of the circle there, but you know, that was a good learning and it certainly does work as advertised. Now the other cool thing is you can put the pin in the back and now presto, you've got a concave surface turning tool, which is really cool. So let's give that a little try here. I'll cut a very large radius into the side of my hemisphere to make an uh, you know, interesting compound curve. Again, this would be primarily for decorative purposes. If you wanna make a chess set, for example, I think the Tornado would be required equipment because it's really well equipped to do this kind of ornamental stuff. The next attachment is this beautiful device, which is the large radius ball turning tool. So this guy has a pin in it just like the other tool, but you can see how much larger it is. And the tool post in this case just sits on there. It doesn't really need to be bolted in because all the forces on it are downwards anyway. And you can see this slides back and forth with a large positioning knob. And then there's also a fine adjust there. And you can see that even with it bolted down, there's still a little bit of range of motion there. And again, that acts like the slot in the small tool to sort of self limit depth of cut. So you can turn very, very large radii indeed with this guy. Now the other crazy feature on this tool is that the pivot point on it is actually on its own pivot. So you can create kind of an epicycle curve. So I'm sure there's some very weird effects you could do with this. I haven't experimented with this a lot. Officially, the design reason for this is that it allows you to get the tool post in close to the back of a sphere that you're turning so that you can turn almost a full sphere in a single setup, which is something that very few ball turners can actually do. So that's a neat feature that I'll be experimenting with more later, I'm sure. And in principle, you can also use this as a very large concave turner, but I think the use cases for this are pretty limited due to the clearance issues there with the leg of the tool. Okay, but now things get crazy. This little guy is a template that you bolt to the table wherever you like. It's got this movable piece of brass sheet stock on it that you cut a profile into. And that profile can then be traced onto your work. I'll show you how that works here. You bring in this contraption here, which is 
people call it the pantograph arm, but it's actually not a pantograph, but it does move freely in the exit plane and it's got a little stylus on the end of it there. If you've read any mechanical engineering, then you'll recognize this as a pair of basic four bar linkages. This is the parallelogram four bar, which is one of the most basic four bar linkages. And it has the property that no matter where the system moves in space, the orientation of the end effector remains constant. So you see this on front end loaders, for example, you can raise and lower the bucket, but the bucket stays level. It's a parallelogram four bar linkage that does that. So with two of them combined, like this device has, the orientation of the scriber there at the end will remain wherever we set it. And that's the key to this tool. Now, again, it's not quite correct to call this a pantograph because a pantograph is itself a specific kind of four bar linkage, wherein two of the pivot joints in that linkage describe the same motion at different ratios, which allows you to scale a motion path up and down. And that's how pantograph engravers work. With the tool post clipped on there, now you can see that we've got a stylus underneath the cutting tool that's going to follow any 2D template that we've cut into that brass. How cool is that? Now, you may have just had the same thought that I had, which is that if we can hold a 2D template for that scriber to follow, why can't we just follow the actual part that we're trying to copy? Now that would require some sort of tricky L-shaped bracket to hold the part in just the right position and at just the right height for the scriber point there to be on the center line of the part that we're copying. So hypothetically, a person could machine a piece of angle iron with a nice flat spot and an edge that would register on the edge of the table there and a clearance hole that would bolt through to bolt the bracket to the table. And then theoretically, a person could mark a slot on it. And then theoretically, they could mill that slot, which would then give you the vertical adjustment to get the part at exactly the right center line. And then theoretically, if someone had, say, a shower knob from a previous project that they wanted to replicate the shape of, that part could be bolted to the bracket and we could follow it directly with the scriber point, theoretically. I also tried mounting the part the other way because that would actually make more sense for machining the part, but unfortunately the mounting bolt for my bracket gets in the way then, so that's food for future development maybe. So I put it back the other way and I put some washers under it so the scriber can access the full part a little bit easier. And then I lined it up so that the scriber tip and the cutting tool are on the same positions in both X and Y on the stock and the part. And my stock here is starting at the same maximum OD as the part. So in theory, this should just work. And away we go. I started by chiseling away at the deepest part of the pattern there. And I will say this took quite a while. And the thing that maybe nobody tells you about this tool, it is amazing, but it is actually fairly hard work. You're pressing pretty hard with your fingers and your hands the whole time. And for a pretty deep and complex pattern like this, this took about 30 minutes. And if like me, you're a software engineer and thus your hands are ruined for life, I was definitely feeling it at the end of this little cutting project here. It worked extremely well and the results were fantastic, but I was pounding some ibuprofen at the end. But I don't care who you are, that is really cool. I mean, look at that, it's a perfect copy of that shape. And that is not an easy shape to copy. The end of it is not a sphere. It's more like an oblate spheroid, sort of like the Earth. It's stretched along the equator, so it's not an easy shape to copy by any other means. And boy, the tornado really did a great job of it. Now, I did it in aluminum, and the kit does say you can use stainless steel with this, but stainless steel would be a lot of work and I don't think I want to attempt it, which is why I'm not currently remaking that shower knob with this tool. Maybe someday. Since I'm here though, I do want to make an honorable mention of another technique for doing this, which many of my viewers commented on that shower knob video about. If you can manage to fixture the part in your tailstock like this, you can rig up a stylus of sorts on your carriage. In this case, I'm using an indicator stand with a little high-speed steel clamped to it there that's the same shape as the cutting tool. That's important. The Tornado does the same thing. The stylus and the cutter are the same shape. Then you can actually follow the part in your tailstock and trace it the same way as the Tornado does. Now this doesn't work in as many situations as the Tornado does, but for some parts like this one, this seems like a really great technique. And I wish I'd known about it when I made those shower knobs because I definitely would have tried it and probably gotten a lot better results than I did by step turning and filing it. In any case, the Tornado is 
super cool, and I'm super excited to have this thing. So thanks again to the viewer that donated it. Shout out to Eccentric Engineering, hashtag not sponsored, but, but they're clearly a great small business making really cool parts, and I'm sure you'll see the tornado on future projects here on my channel. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all this content possible, and I will see you next time.